Hello again, welcome back. Hope everybody had a good lunch and I hope everybody managed to beat the Tetris. Um, we'll let you know at the end of the day who won the competition prizes. Um, and now we're going to launch in just a, into just a couple of short talks here. On track one, we're going to have Russell Beggs, who's going to tell us a few useful tips on how to become a better engineer. And on track two, we're going to have Ralph McTaggart, who will talk about becoming a senior engineer. Okay, um, take it away, Russell. I'm going to take the rather unorthodox step of talking about a non-technical subject at what is, tradition, what, what is a uh, developer conference. And there's a couple of different reasons for that. One, I think, um, is that it's, it's hard to find technical topics that other people aren't covering. And the other is, actually, this is some stuff that is pretty much overlooked, um, but I think could be useful to a lot of you um, out there. Anyone who knows me will have heard me say that I've never known what a mission-driven company is, and uh, up until I started with working with ESO 12 months ago, where pretty much everyone who's at the company does so, so that they are working on software applications or products that uh, customers can use to collect data and ultimately improve the outcomes for patients and really make a difference in, in, in the world. A little bit more about me, I'm pretty much a geek. I've always been interested in, in technology, in computers, in software engineering. And I've had the fortunate opportunity of traveling the world and working in Asia Pacific, uh, North America and Europe. And through that journey uh, in my career, I've, I've learned a lot of lessons. And I think uh, a number of those lessons have been things that I wouldn't have known when I set out on this journey. So this whole talk is really about trying to say to my past self, what, would you, what advice would you give me? And, you know, it's not rocket science, as I said. The first one is learning to walk before you run. And I had this thing when I left university where it could probably be pretty much described as hubris. On one hand, I was saying, I can't believe how much I learned on my year out as a placement student compared to what I learned at uni. And on the other hand, I thought I knew everything. And that's something that's probably come back to me time and time again, whenever I've changed from a project to a new project, or I've changed teams, or I've changed roles. Every time I've started out, I've found it very difficult, very challenging, very wobbly. And as I get more comfortable and experienced with that, then I feel much more at ease. So the thing I would say, say to my past self is, be teachable, you, things will always change. And if, you're, if you've got that open mindset, it'll really help you um, deal with the, the challenging situations. And related to that is, is seeking counsel. You can learn from others. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't understand. And that's something that I was probably fiercely independent of when I first started out. And speaking with my own team and trying to get advice on, on this talk, that was one of the things that they said, that they, they found that asking for advice was super helpful to move forward. And I think there's a, two points to that. One is, you also don't want to be that guy who's constantly asking for help and nagging everyone around them and distracting everyone around them. So take your time, go off, do some research, do some Googling, get a better understanding. And if you come to someone more senior and say something like, hey, I've got to this point, I've tried this, I've learned this, but I'm really stuck on that, can you help me? You'll find them to be a lot more receptive. One final point on this is that young children, as a sign of their intelligence, the ones who are more intelligent tend to be asking lots and lots of questions. If anyone's been around toddlers, they will know how many times to say what or why and things like that. Somewhere along the journey, we lose that. We get more fearful of what people will think. Try to, try to let that go. Ask for help. One thing I think is super important to learn is design patterns. And patterns have been used in various different industries for, for a long time. Patterns are used to temp for templates for wallpapers so that we can wallpaper walls over and over again. It allows things to scale and be done at a much greater, greater um, scale. The important thing about the design patterns though is not that you go off and you read the book and you know all the different types of them. The important thing is knowing where to use them. If you've been to a house that's been decorated horrendously where everything looks exactly the same all over the place, that's a good analogy for using the wrong design pattern the wrong way. Um, that's uh, another important key. One thing that I really wrestle with is that there seem to be these people in computer science and software engineering in the IT industry who just know how to solve problems. You know, you might have a team that's wrestling with something for some time, they can't work it out, and you wheel this guy in and he just knows instantly where to look, what to do, and he gets it sorted quickly. And I don't think that's by chance. 
Some of the, the outages I've experienced that have had me travel across the world at zero notice and end up in Singapore and places like that have really taught me to reflect on those individuals who are able to troubleshoot really quickly. And one of the things they tend to do is they tend to be really empirical about it. And this is something you can apply to your debugging and other techniques, but when it comes to troubleshooting issues, define your hypotheses, test those hypotheses, and then refine based on those. So you'll have either proven or disproven those, those hypotheses, and that allows you to tell which track to go down. I'm sure everyone's been in that position where you've got a group of people looking at a problem and ideas are flung out everywhere and everyone's saying, do this, change that. And when that happens, that can lead to a bit of chaos and it can lead to things changing and you're not sure if it's making worse or better. Bringing a bit of structure, a bit of calm, control, composure, and following those steps really helps with solving any problem, whether it's a crisis or just getting that bug or defect fixed. And the last one from the learning perspective is probably one of the most difficult. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of how you do this, but it's more something you need to do. When I left uni, there was no such thing as emotional intelligence, there was no such thing. There probably was things such as self-awareness, but I wasn't aware of them. Uh, and this has probably been one of the biggest things on, on my journey. And everyone will have their own way of working out how to know more about themselves. But when you do know a little bit more about yourself, whether that's through meditation or other techniques that might be out there, you can realize that you may be projecting your own circumstances onto the situations around you. You might be bringing your own prejudices, your own anger, your own frustration, your own knowledge even. And that can play out in the conversations that you have with other individuals. When you're more self-aware, when you're more responsive versus reactive, then you can have different conversations with individuals. And in my experience, that's really helped me to thrive in my career. We talked about the learning. Now this is more about the doing and more principles around um, how you might go about this. What, the first thing for me is putting the happiness first. If you constantly think that happiness lives at the end of the rainbow, it's after I get married, it's after I get the new house, it's after I get the job or promotion, you'll constantly be looking for that happiness. A lot of people do this and I myself did that as well. What a lot of uh, research at Harvard is showing is if you put happiness first, then those things come as a byproduct. And people who have that happiness advantage tend to be a lot more successful and a lot more um, creative in, in their outlook in life. A really simple thing to think about is how can you possibly be happy if you're not doing things that make you happy? And that's usually something to, to reflect on, to work out what you enjoy doing and making sure that you're doing it to get that happiness and then you'll see your, your career succeed. And related to that is being yourself, being authentic. Who are you? Don't come to work with a mask. Don't pretend to be someone else. The mask will slip. You'll get tired. You'll get frustrated. And the emotions will come out in weird and wacky ways. Now, there is a caveat to that. You know, don't think that you are the, the most special person in the universe and everyone just needs to fall in line with your thinking. This comes back to that self-realization, um, self self-awareness point. When you know yourself a bit better, then you hopefully can determine when you're being, being a good guy and you're not being the jerk and uh, you're getting on with, with individuals while being authentic and being yourself. This is something that I constantly have to challenge myself on, and I think everyone does. And the reality is that it's much easier to put someone down than it is to lift them up. And I know I've been around individuals who, who kind of lay out down the put downs and put you, make you feel not like you're, you're doing a great job. And that's really not constructive. That doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the individual giving that feedback and it doesn't help the individual receiving it. And what I find is it's much more important to lift people up around you, to give praise where it's due and, and to really push people forward. Because that will not just help you progress, but it will help other people around you progress. A great example of this is whenever you get to high levels of professional ten tennis coaching, the coaches don't constantly correct individuals on what they're doing wrong. They praise what they're doing right, and they give one or two small little corrections for them to work on. And that's super important, because once they've got to that level, they know what they're doing. They don't need to be told what they're not doing. They already know. They just need a bit more encouragement. One thing I think that puts all of us on the back foot is our fears. And I think the first step is admitting that you have fears and what those are, and everyone's different. Some might have a fear of heights, some might have a fear of public speaking, confrontation, whatever it happens to be. The first step is understanding that they exist. The second step is realizing that you, you can overcome them. Realize I haven't said, don't be afraid. That's a little bit trite. 
you can overcome them and how you overcome them is through things like graded exposure. If anyone's ever been bouldering, you don't jump off a 30 foot cliff into water straight away. You start off with a small jump and then a bigger jump and a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one, building your confidence as you go to overcome that fear and jump off the big cliff. And this is probably one of the hardest tips to, to, to bear in mind and to overcome. And that is communication is key. I think everyone can agree that it's very, very obvious. And it's especially obvious whenever we're working in the middle of a pandemic and you're not talking to people in the office in the same way. You have to be more deliberate about that communication and you have to be more precise. But one thing I find super useful in that is replaying what I think someone said, said to me back to them. So when somebody has had a conversation with me, just summarizing up and saying, just to be clear, so what I think you're saying is this, is that right? absolutely helps you to go away both on the same proverbial page in the same direction as opposed to both going away with your own understanding in different directions. And, and finally, to wrap up, a couple of bonus tips. And the first one is computer science does not make you a software engineer. And that sort of ties into the first one of walking before you run. But I'd also encourage people to realize that there's other things you can do. You can be a QA engineer, a QA automation engineer, an SDET. You can be a, someone in compliance and risk compliance. You can be someone who works in infrastructure and writes infrastructure as code. And some of the most talented computer scientists that I've worked with have went on that journey and aren't necessarily software engineers right now. And then finally is building the community. Being part of a, con a conference like this is a start in that journey. These are super important. When I left for Australia in 2004, there was not much of a developer community in Belfast. I was so encouraged when I came back in 2009, how it was fledgling, and so encouraged by how it has grown over the last decade. I encourage you all to be part of that, to contribute to it, and to continue to learn from it and help others learn from it. Thank you. Thanks very much. And that was a fantastic talk. Next up on track one, we have Martin McKeadney uh, going through DynamoDB. And on track two, we have uh, Kubernetes uh, from, apologies, my memory's not as good as Mark's, <laughs> <laughs> James Glennon. Um, so enjoy.